Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Patrick Cristiano, your host, the publisher of TheaterLife.com, a website for theater buffs covering all things theater. And I have a really special guest today, Eric Weber, writer, director. Uh, you've had a fascinating life, Eric. It's very interesting, the journey that you have been on. Thank you so much for coming to share it with us. Thank, Thank you, you for having me and letting me talk about it <laughs> and myself. Always, it never seems that fascinating to me. I'm glad you find it interesting. Well, I, I don't think we realize how interesting our lives is until we take, kind of take a step back and yeah. look at what's happened to us and where we're at in relation. But you've had quite an interesting journey. I mean, you started out as an advertising executive and you worked your way up. And uh, while you were in, what was it, Young and Rubicon? Is that yes, it? yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you were making television commercials. You had some really good jingles that you made. Tell us what was a couple of them. Well, I think the most notable one was, I'm a pepper, you were a pepper, wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? <laughs> but I didn't write the jingle. Uh, you just produced it? Well, uh, it's interesting to me how uh, uh, the assignment was to come up with a great new Dr. Pepper campaign. Uh -huh. And it was my friend Frank DeVito's account. He's an art director, I'm a copywriter. So he's supposed to come up with the pictures, me, the words. Usually it's, it's very interchangeable. So uh, I had my own accounts and Frank said, look, it's an emergency, we, we need a new campaign. And Dr. Pepper was the <clears throat> hippest, coolest account at wow. Young and Rubicam. They did the most interesting advertising, so I was excited to work on it. But because Frank has had his big accounts, I had mine, we would work at night. We'd go to some little bistro near Y&R on 38th Street, and we'd sit around, have a bottle of wine, dinner, and try and come up with ideas. And we were getting nowhere, five, six nights in a row. And uh, now it's 10.30 at night. I got to go back to Jersey. Frank's got to go out to Huntington. We've consumed at least one bottle of wine. And he says, I got an idea. I got an idea. He said, how about a bunch of like 13 year old girls, kind of tough girls, and they have denim jackets on and the jackets all say pepper, peppers on the back. He said, now nah, that sucks. I said, wait a second. No, it doesn't suck. It's great. Everybody who drinks the stuff, I'm cleaning it up. <laughs> Everybody who drinks the stuff is a pepper. You know, a girl brings home a guy and uh, the mom says, is, it, is he a lawyer? Is he a doctor? And she says, no, he's, he's a, a pepper. pepper. <laughs> so Frank said, I, you're right, this is great. And he wrote, um, I'm a pepper, you're a pepper, wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? We called Jake Holmes, the great jingle writer. Uh, within a week, uh, Jake had written the song that, that you see you know, in all the TV commercials. And then the account people, the suits came in and said, well, yeah, it's very clever, but it's destroying the copyright of the word pepper and the client will never buy it. That's what the suits always used to do. They wow. looked for the negative side. <laughs> anyway, a lot was, of people do that today still. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, uh, because it was his account, brought it down to Texas where Dr. Pepper was. Right. The, uh, they presented it, the head of the, the, you know, the suits were saying, we're worried about the copyright issues. The head of the company said, screw it. I love it. Let's do it. And that was how the campaign was born. Wow, that's a fabulous story. <laughs> but now, while you're, while you're working there, Young and Rubicon, you write this book, uh, How to Pick Up Girls. Right. With it sells right. three million copies. It's translated into 20 languages worldwide. And that's a really heady experience. It, it was. It, 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 it didn't come easily. Well, what um, does? Come what on. does? I don't know. What, um, <laughs> I had you the, still uh, have to lay the groundwork, even if it comes easily. Right. I had the idea in the spring of 1965. I had just moved to New York, gotten a job as a copy, a junior copywriter at an ad agency, and I began to see all these attractive New York women uh, coming out of Bonwitz. Bergdorf. But at this time, you're still shy. You're not. Uh, I'm incredibly so, shy. So you really, you, I'm you wrote this book shy. to help yourself, right? Yes. This, yeah. this, 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 this was to cut down the techniques for yourself to, to kind of try to follow. 
Yes. Yeah. Now, t- now tell us what happened. What the, this is a big hit. This book it, it, you, it, it launches you in terms of putting you on the map right. as, as a creative person. And now you run into at an airport or what, the coffee shop. What happens? Uh, I'm in Be- I'm in Beverly Hills Hotel, mm-hmm. the coolest hotel in the world. I'm out in California shooting Arrow shirt commercials as part of my you know I'm working in advertising. Right. You're doing it. Commercial. <laughs> and I run into a guy named Steve Gordon who used to work in my ad agency and had moved out to LA to make movies and wrote and directed the movie Arthur, which became a huge right. hit. And he sees me walking by the coffee shop and I go in and we give each other a hug. I'm so excited to see him, very happy for his success. And he says, and, you, and those crazy books of yours, How to Pick Up Girls, 100 Best Opening Lines. And Steve, I mean, yeah, Steve is with this short little guy with jet black hair and a shark skin suit on. And he begins writing down all the titles. And uh, um, Steve Gordon says to this little guy, this is my friend Eric. He writes all these crazy books. This is uh, Norman Brokaw from William Morris. I say hi, nice. I don't think much of it. Spend Fast the day. Forward. What does he do? Yeah. He calls you. How 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 fast? How fast? I get I get back to my hotel room. And he's, he's already Brad. I got five there. messages from him and the head of William Morris. They say, "Come on in. We want to meet you." And he sell they they sell this. They make this into a TV. They movie. sell it to Alan King, the comedian who has a production company. Mm-hmm. Within six weeks, they sold the idea to ABC TV to make it a. An uh, ABC movie of the week, and six months later, it's on television uh, with Abe Vigoda, Polly Bergen, uh, and and you're you're off and running. You're, you're off and running from this point, right? Yes. This, this this really sets you up. Now now you you've made about four or five films. From from there, you uh, made the first film you made with Suits. Uh, suits. I had you wrote it and directed it. Wrote it, directed it. You raised the money yourself. Raised the money, produced it, shot it, starring uh, the comedian um, Robert Klein. You know him? Anyway. Right, of course we know Robert <laughs> Klein. <laughs> and uh, it was in a couple of big festivals, and it's run on HBO, Showtime, and all around the world. Your, your films have been in all kinds of festivals. The Hampton yes. Festival, Sundance Festival, Palm Spring, Montreal. Bangkok too, even All yeah, Bangkok. World. <laughs> yeah, but you have now a film that's um, Emily and Tim that's based on a short story that you wrote, The Pack. Right. That that sound is really. We have, you want to show the clip first? Or you want to tell them about it first? Uh, let me t- uh, tell tell them about it. tell the world about yeah, it first. I, I think it's a fascinating concept. Okay. Um, I've been married fifty. Four years and our now. Time is going fast, so we have to kind of speed it up. Let's talk bit. fast. I'll talk fast. Okay. <laughs> I've been married fifty-four years. No, don't talk fast. Just shorten your stories. <laughs> and it's it's interesting to me how complicated a marriage is. Sometimes you're madly in love. Sometimes you can't stand each other. <laughs> uh, but sometimes you want to kill each other. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of it, you're there for each other. And I thought I'd make a film reflecting that. But instead of casting people who look like each other to represent the six different decades I covered, I said, that's too much work, and I never like it when I see some other movie that does it. So I said, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to use people of different races. I'm going to use a gay couple in one of the scenes. I'm going to use a black couple in one of the scenes. And so that's what I did. And if we look at the trailer, you can see that even though it's the same couple, they look very different as, as so the decades the, the, the go The couple by. is Emily and Tim, right. but at different periods of their relationship, like a 60-year relationship, is, is that what you said it was? Yes, yeah. A 60-year relationship. But at different decades, they're represented by different people. And they just be, look different. And they even, you even have a gay couple. Yes. It's one of the... The fourth of, decade. But it's always Emily and Tim. Always Em and Tim. Yep. Okay. Okay, and, and it's it's now uh, you can even see it on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Amazon yes. Prime. Okay, let, let, let's let, let's have the trail. We have a trailer for this, I believe. There's one thing you can say about the marriage of Tim and Emily. It started in bed. Forty nine years together, and you're still talking about sex. Emily. 
everything is going to be okay. Here comes the guilt trip. Stop it. Could have called. I lost all track of time. Hey, come on, come here. <laughs> Why is Grandpa crying? Because he is so happy for Mommy and Daddy and you. Fascinating concept that you've put together there. How do you get all these? It's an incredible cast that you have. How do you get all these wonderful people? By scheduling them for one week only. Okay. So all of those, no, none of those people work more than four or five days. Mm -hmm. So we were able to pay them what felt like a lot of money, but it wasn't for a big star because we only paid them for one week. So it's an extraordinary cast, and and you directed this as well. Wrote and directed, yeah. Did, did, did you raise the money for this one? How did this one come into fruition? You have, you have your way. We, you also have your own film company, which we right. didn't tell the audience about. It's called the Tenafly. Tenafly Film Company. It's just a production vehicle, you know, for making films. Uh, I did have a very good executive producer on this film named Bob Quinn, mm -hmm. and he raised much of the money. And, and after you raised the money, you shot it with your film company and then sold it? Yes. So this one you did raise the money for and sold afterwards. Sold afterwards. So you were that kind. Never do that. <laughs> Always get a deal up front. But I, I have to make my movies, so so I violate. But when my you own have the rule. passion for something and you know it in your gut it's going to be good, you got to risk it sometimes, right? You do. You I do. Mean, yeah. <laughs> rules are meant to be broken, right? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So this sounds like a really fascinating movie. You can see it on Amazon. You can see it on Amazon. Uh, it was on, uh, on Nets, Netflix for a while. I don't think it still is. And uh, it's going to be on Peacock and Crackle very soon because I'm working on deals. Uh, so you can see it's streaming for free. How long is it about? Just it's in, uh, 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Now, you've, you've done a lot of uh, films. What's the other film? Second Best was that was, that was in the Hamptons International? That, that was in the Hamptons in October of 2004. It was in Sundance. That was my biggest achievement in a way. I was in a morbid depression, Patrick, because I, I hadn't gotten into, I hadn't heard from Sundance. It was Thanksgiving. I had relatives coming. The weather was gray and gloomy. And I said, ah, I guess I didn't get into Sundance. I got a phone call from John Cooper. And he said, hi, is this Eric? This is the Sundance Film Festival. He said, you know, I don't like Joe Pantoliano very much, but your film made me laugh. Joe Pantoliano, <laughs> Joey Pants is the star of my film. Right, and he said, you're in, <laughs> you're in. So that made me feel good. But no, did this sound like, what was this film about? It sounded very interesting, I forgot. It's about a, a, a guy, a failed publisher, who's selling suits at the mall, but he's a writer. And he, he writes a website in which he it's too you know it's too long a story you okay. can see it on crackle and peacock for okay. free right now so did, it's a comedy but what you know one of the quite when we were talking on the phone on, on monday or a few days ago yeah. when we chatted on the phone and you told me the story about the william morris agent that you met in the airport right. through your friend and i thought of this question do you uh do you believe in destiny? Do you think there's a destiny to our lives? Do you think things play out according to something that we don't always have control over that happens? Be often because of actions we take that put us into a particular place, like you were there, you took the yeah. action, you wrote the book, you, but then you're in the airport, your friend calls you, so you did everything to put yourself there. Do you think there's a destiny to that? No. You don't believe no, in no, destiny? No, 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 I don't. 
It's not that I don't believe in it or I do believe in it. I do think if you're interested in doing something with your life that's important or important to you, that you just have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. I've been writing now for 60 years, a lot of times without success, sometimes with success, but I just do it. Yeah, but my question was, do you think you were destined to be a writer? I was, yes, I was destined to be a writer, not by somebody up here, but the way- By the, by, I'm not, I'm, yeah. by the organics of the whole- Organics thing. of my brain and my body and uh, who I am. The chemistry of the world. Yeah. I wasn't yeah. destined to be a pro football tackle. <laughs> not obviously <laughs> not. <laughs> because, as I said, I was 5'5", five, five, I'm now 5'3". <laughs> and I don't think <laughs> I would not go there. <laughs> very good. I'm shrinking too, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it either. <laughs> Anyway, so now you you also have now uh, started a series, a, a YouTube series that yes. you wrote, created, and you star in with your son, Nick. My son, Nick Weber, a Hamptons guy, if there ever were one. An artist, too. A very, very good, serious artist. He came to me and he was pushing his album. He's also a musician. He, had a, he has a, a funny rock, rap kind of an album called Girl Problems. And he said, Dad, you wrote How to Pick Up Girls. I've wrote, written this little playlet about you giving me advice. So I said, let me see it. I said, that, I thought that's no good. Anyway, I said, sure, I'll be in it. It got thousands and you know, tens of thousands of views. So I said, this is fun. I play a character called Wing Dad, giving very poor, unwoke advice to young men on how to do better. But he's taking, he's taking your bad advice. He's taking my bad advice okay. and... And getting good results or bad results? Mixed results. Mixed, mixed results. Mixed results. Okay. Mixed results. Mixed Which, results. Would you, right. <laughs> Which is realistic. <laughs> and we have, we have a trailer, yeah. uh, I think, from Wing Dad. Uh, can, can we show that to the guests, please? Your girl's got a Sancho? What's that? You know, a Sancho, a man who has a continuing sexual relationship with a married woman. Yo te lo dije. He's got a Sancho. It all started when I caught my wife cheating on me. Somehow, though, I was the one who got thrown out. With nowhere to go, I moved back in with my parents. Mom thought you might be hungry. She made your favorite. And if that wasn't bad enough, my dad is the one and only author of How to Pick Up Girls. Oh, you are a very striking young woman. But I think the time has come for my own son to read the book. He keeps on saying he's here to help me get back in the game. I'm, I'm a painter and I would love to do a painting of you. Here, um, here's my car. I'm gonna go for a swim, wanna come? No, I don't wanna get my hair wet. What color are your eyes? Brown. But sometimes I wonder whose interest he really has at heart here. That's not her. Don't tell mom. Give us space. You won't even know I'm here. All right, move your hair. I want to do your movie. Oh. Drop that ridiculous show. Yeah, that's lovely. Just lovely. Hey, Dad, you want to stop molesting my date? What, do you want her to get skin cancer? Yeah. Jeez. Yes, but how do you rub my shoulders and my feet at the same time? Dirty old rascal, you. <laughs> I know. Not, I'm not very woke. <laughs> anyway, but you know, these are how how long are these episodes? They were about five minutes, four and a half minutes. And they yeah. show on YouTube. YouTube, uh, wing. Just go and put in Wing Ted, and uh, there are 15 of them. But you you have an, you had an idea to put them all together, uh, condense them down into a 21 minute kind of right. segment, right. and then do what with it? We're going to shop it. And then, and then, de then develop it into some kind of series where they would might develop it further. Yeah, yeah well, or make more of them. I mean, we we, we make five minute ones. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make twenty one minute ones. Mm -hmm. They're a lot of fun to make. It's a very Hamptonsy show, 
you know, we were always featuring Stephen Talkhouse mm -hmm. or Hampton Things, mm -hmm. and uh, now and you would keep it Hamptons, and that would be part yeah. of the theme of it too. And the problem is, it worked in real life. My son got married at fifty, and ha now has two babies and, <laughs> and a wife, a beautiful, wonderful wife. So, so I, from so, but he. It happened before Wing Dad, right? No, it happened during, during Wing Dad. So, so literally the, during the, Wing Dad. The, thing, the bad advice you were giving him actually worked, and he got married and produced two children in the yes, process. Yes, in a very short period of wow. time. Wow. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, now, we're running, we've got a little bit of time, but you have a new project that you're excited about that there's a little bit of buzz in L.A. Um, it's called Race Music. Yes, You want yes. to tell us about that? I do, I do. When I was a kid, 13, 14, I used to listen to what they called race music, R&B, rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. And I could only hear it on African-American stations. I couldn't hear the music on the big white stations. Right. And what would happen is a black entertainer would do a great version. Then six months to a year later, Pat Boone or, you know, some, or George Gibbs would do the white version, become a huge hit. And all those singers lived to ripe old ages. And all the rhythm and blues singers like Jackie Wilson died in their 40s, 30s, 50s. And I, I've always thought, what a tragedy that is. It is. So this concept, this script, race music, pays homage to the great artists, the black R&B artists of the 50s. Oh, and uh, we take a kid from that era who lives in Kansas and has to tune in the black stations from Philly late at night. And in his search, he goes into Kansas City to a, a record store that specials, uh, specializes in R&B. He falls into a portal and winds up in Kansas City 2022, <laughs> where he meets two young black rappers, a boy and a girl, and they make incredible music together. And they become such a big hit, they get a manager, but the kid from the 50s wants to go back home. And they help, his friends help him find the portal, and something bad happens, and all three tumble into the portal. And now we're back in the 50s, and these two black kids from modern day Kansas City are living in the sticks in Kansas wow. in the 50s. And we have two, two visuals, I think, that, that that show you the kind of feel of the series. Look, this, this is, this is, is, this is them when they've when all three have gone back to Kansas. Okay, and th this is a cover for for something. What is it? It's a cover for the script. Okay, and this is a pilot script for a TV show. It's going to be a TV show. Episode. I hope it's going to be a TV show. And then we have another image too of uh, what's the other image? Yeah, that's the that's the image when the white kid winds up in modern day Kansas and meets his friend, Marcus, who's a very serious rapper. At first, suspicion and hostility. And then when Marcus begins to hear the 50s licks, sax licks, mm -hmm. and it adds magic to his raps, this is when these kids really bond and start to make great, great music together. Yeah, how much, how much of this have you written already? It's all written. It's ready to go. In fact, if there's a smart producer out there hearing this, so you contact me. Did you have written episodes already? We've written, uh, we've written it as a 90-minute movie and as a one-hour TV series. So we have pilots on both. But it also could be a series that have different... I would, it really is meant to be a series. The first year or two is when the kid from 57 mm -hmm. winds up in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And then two or three years later, all three, he and his two new friends wind up back in Kansas in the 50s. And then, there, of course, the kids, the black kids from the from modern times are going to have to go back home eventually. Now, what's fascinating is how you do all this without an agent. You, you, you're, you're your agent, you're a shopper, you're your you're producer. You kind of just do it all and make it happen. <laughs> I you, tried you, to. You don't, you don't think that's unusual? You don't think that's, um, what was the word? Uh, um, that's fascinating that you can do all that stuff. You, you don't appreciate the journey that, uh, that, that you created for yourself. 
Well, I don't. I, let me put it this way: I don't glory in it. No, I didn't, and, I didn't have to. And uh, that wasn't what I meant by. And I feel blessed. I feel blessed not so much at having any particular talent, just having the energy oh, yes, to keep on going mm -hmm. back at it. Because I don't know what else. You can only play, a man can only play so much golf. <laughs> I don't play golf at all. I do tennis. Smart. <laughs> you can, a man can only play so much tennis, too. After that all, your true. body just can't take it anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I'm almost at that limit, uh, too. We, we are about out of time. We have a couple of minutes. Is there anything else you want to tell me that I didn't ask you or share with the audience? That, um, um, anything else I want to talk about? Because you've got so much, so many irons in the fire. This uh, race music sounds like it. It's really yeah, I, I mean, I, I love talking about race music because that music, you know, that kid was me. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I used to do my homework to it. And I just loved it. And I was always so enraged when I would hear the big, lousy, white mm. commercial version. I hate anything that's not done well, <laughs> as it could be. One of the, I, I did mention it to you before, and I think this is interesting. I was at a very super white, kind of waspy country club in Arizona, a golf club, mm. having lunch. And they pipe in music, and it was a very elegant place. Mm -hmm. And they pipe in music, and what do I hear? The R and B from the fifties, not the oh. lousy commercial version, the good stuff, but the good stuff. And it made me think: eventually, eventually, authenticity will out. Eventually, authenticity, because from your lips to God's ears, because I believe the same thing. And let's. Just believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true. It's the only I think thing it's true, with. you know, when people go back and look it's at... It's just like the truth will went, went out. The same thing. Yeah. Is. That, I, that I'm not as, as optimistic about. But, you know, if somebody goes, you know... I, I am because it's authentic. It's authentic if it's the truth. Yeah. So it's going to win, too. We're out of time. <laughs> All right. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. Really appreciate the chance. Ditto, to... ditto, ditto. Thank you so much for coming. It's been my right. pleasure. Thank you for having me. All righty. Okay.